True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. Three siblings are reunited after their older brother returns from the UK. They decide to take a bit of a break together with friends. They're fishing, drinking, laughing and simply enjoying being back together after all they've been through. It starts to rain. But that doesn't spoil the atmosphere. Then it all goes horribly wrong. A disagreement breaks out and one sibling storms off into the darkness of the South African night. Her brothers are sure she's gone to bed, but the stark light of morning will reveal something quite different. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht and you're listening to episode 40, The Disappearance of Dawn Byrne. Before I get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Breeze, Linzal Buerta, Mapansi Hulo, and Lee Fernandez. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. It is hugely appreciated. I released the September Patreon exclusive episode a few days ago, and that's waiting on the Patreon platform for you to listen to. If you'd like to support the show through Patreon or a one-off donation through PayPal, I'll leave the links in the show notes. As always, any form of support is greatly appreciated, and it doesn't have to be financial. Sharing of episodes, inviting your friends and family to listen, and interacting on social media are all great ways to help keep the show growing and improving. I can't remember the first time I came across Dawn's case. I know that a few people contacted me and suggested I cover it, so it was on my radar. And then, as it often does with these things, it all fell into place. I made contact with a private investigator who's been working on Dawn's case, and he told me that he had many other missing person cases he'd like me to cover. Leon Rousseau, from Consulting Detectives, also told me that he was recently involved in a television series called Firmus, which is Afrikaans for missing. The show has covered 10 of the missing person cases he's worked on, and we agreed that at some stage I'll cover all of them. At the same time as I was talking to Leon, I was also speaking with Alicia Tizen. Alicia is one of those friends that every person wishes they had in their lives. I've covered a few cases where friends of the victim have been amazing champions, but Alicia really has gone above and beyond. I also spoke with Dawn's brother, Jonathan, who lives in the UK, about his sister and her disappearance. And as you'll hear, he speaks about the generational devastation that a missing persons case has on a family. This is episode 40, The Disappearance of Dawn Byrne. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Dawn Byrne was born on the 10th of February 1981 in Nelstrom. She is the middle child of George and Audrey Byrne. Her older brother Jonathan and her younger brother Alan lived a relatively normal and happy childhood until their parents divorced when Dawn was six years old. I didn't really dig down too deep into this part of the story but I think it's important to mention that Audrey, their mom, 
also disappeared from her children's lives. The exact circumstances around her disappearance are not known to me, but I do know that from the time of their parents' divorce, the children had no further contact with their mother. And to this day, her whereabouts, according to a social media post by Jonathan Byrne, are still unknown. George Byrne, the children's father, set about raising his three children on his own, and within a few years, he'd remarried. Jonathan would relay that his stepmother had her own daughter, and all four children soon adapted to a new family dynamic. Sadly, that wouldn't last. When Dawn was 12 years old, their stepmother passed away, followed in quick succession by their father, who succumbed to a heart condition. The Byrne children were left alone in the world. Jonathan would be taken in by family friends to complete the last few years of his schooling, but unfortunately the couple could not take Dawn and Alan in too, and they would be sent to live in Abraham Creel Children's Home in Nailstrom. When I spoke to Jonathan, he expressed guilt about this, and the fact that soon after he'd matriculated, he moved to the UK. Dawn did not allow the tragedies in her life to define her, though, and many would say that her strong character and will were a testament to the difficulties she'd survived. When she aged out of the children's home, she managed to find her own flat, which was a cottage in Kensington, Johannesburg, on the property of a family, and she was working. Life seemed to be looking up for Dawn. She had a large group of good friends, among them Alicia Tizen. Dawn was also dating on and off, but didn't seem to be in any serious relationships. In 2004, Jonathan returned to South Africa from the UK with his fiancée. Their intention was to get married in South Africa and then enjoy a honeymoon slash holiday here with Jonathan's siblings. Jonathan arrived in SA and he and his now wife, Emma, stayed with Dawn in her flat for a month. I asked Jonathan about that time. Yeah, I mean, Dawn is set it all up. You know, our intention was always to sort of eventually, you know, when we got our car set up, because we weren't going to hire a car and stuff. Uh, we, I wanted to show my wife to be Africa, if you like, and renting a car was just going to be super expensive. So I thought, you know what, let's procure a car, tent it, you know, go around all these game reserves and stuff like that and just have yeah, like a little bit of a safari kind of thing. And, and, and Dawn and being Dawn and kindly put us up. And yeah, it was, it was quite cool. She, she was, I, I got the impression she was quite excited as well because, you know, her brother's back, you know, uh, you know, we were, we were having little parties and stuff. She was introducing to her friends and it was, it was just a good time. We were introduced to Alicia. It was just, it was quite a, quite a, quite a cool time. Jonathan purchased a little runabout car and on the 19th of November, 2004, Jonathan, Emma, Dawn, her younger brother Alan, their friend Carl and his girlfriend all piled into the vehicle and headed off for a fishing weekend at a resort called Van Boer in Lindekiesdruf, which is in the northwest province of South Africa. The Van Boer resort is set on the banks of the Vaal River, which is the largest tributary to the Orange River. The resort has camping facilities, cottages and caravan sites, and is about an hour away from Johannesburg. The main route to Van Boer is along the N1 highway. Jonathan described the entry to the resort as well as how it was laid out. So, from memory, there was a dirt road from when you enter. Uh, there's a lot of roadworks uh, around that part leading up to the, you know, there was like a bit of a uh, dirt road that we have to go onto. Uh, a well-used uh, dirt road, I must add. So it just looked like there was a lot of traffic on there. Um, so you turn into the, this, this gate and then it turns into like a two-track road, which then winds through sort of trees and whatnot and other little bungalows. And like a, uh, it's almost like a, uh, um, 
you've got office, you know, like a like a reception bit, uh, and then and then you have your little bungalow set with sort of in trees, a bit of a gradient. So how they overcome that gradient, they step down sort of by like a couple of meters or a meter and a half stepping down. So you could they built these walls all the way down to the bank of the river, which was then grass, uh, and you can sort of have these little dry places that you can sort of you have your like a little spot that you can sort of fish at. The group settled in, setting up their braai, a barbecue for those outside of South Africa, and baiting their fishing rods. As is the case with most weekends of this nature, especially considering they were all young people, the alcohol was flowing too. Everyone was having a great time though, Jonathan says. The siblings were catching up after years of not seeing each other, and the atmosphere was relaxed. Dawn had asked Emma to keep her cell phone and flat keys. They were near the water and enjoying some drinks, so it's likely that was the most responsible thing to do. Emma had put Dawn's belongings into her own bag, which was in the cottage a few metres from where they were fishing. Emma was the first to go to bed that night, and I asked Jonathan about what had happened next. I reckon it was about, well, Emma... Uh, my fiance, which is my wife now, but she went to bed at around about, I reckon it was about half nine, ten, and we carried on fishing. It started raining in and out, quite blustery, windy. It, it wasn't ideal fishing weather, but, you know, we were having a good time, you know, uh, had a few drinks by then. You can imagine uh, we've had, had, our, uh, had a bit of a braai going on, probably about around about 11, I would say, uh, because we carried we carried on sort of fishing. Uh, Thorny lost interest a bit i mean we, she had a she had a rod and we were sort of like trying to sort of between myself and carl and my my, my little brother alan trying to sort of try and help her out and, and you know get a hook on or you know just being brothers really uh just helping her out and, and I, at, at that point she was kind of losing interest or she was sort of under the influence and she you know she she, she lost interest the rod was outside and we persevered and we carried on uh, fishing and she was just sort of sitting there keeping it company really if you can imagine she was kind of niggling sort of you know when I say niggling she was like sort of making these comments provoking a response if you like you know she was saying things really got to the better of me really at the time because... it had started to rain and everyone in the group had had a decent amount to drink as you heard Jonathan says that Dawn's mood started to change now I think we need to take two things into account here the Byrne siblings have had a tumultuous life. They were separated after their parents passed away, and then Jonathan moved to the UK. Although they all still had really strong bonds, I don't think it's strange at all that there would have been a few unresolved issues between the three. The second thing to consider is that I think we all know that when alcohol is involved, we often say things that have been on our minds for some time but we've not had the courage to raise. Jonathan says that Dawn started to say things to him in the heat of the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think started off by, if I can remember, because I felt quite bad, actually, when just something in the lines of, you guys have been away for so long, you know, you left us here, us, me, uh, Alan and, and, and Dawny, you come back, you know, uh, my friend now, you know, Carl is standing next to me. Carl is sort of like was, is Dawn's friend, you know, and, and he's now become your friend sort of thing. Oh, you know, we were just having a good time, you know, and, and it just sort of erupted there from there. And she started kicking drinks over, beers over, and just being spiteful, really. You know, so, you know, she wasn't in control. You know, I, I felt that. And then she, what I assumed from there, gone to bed. So Dawn had lost a lot of her family. She'd lost her biological mother, her father, and her stepmother all before she was 12 years old. She was then separated from her older brother too. I think it stands to reason that she would have been very protective of the bonds that she'd formed with her friends. It seems to me that Dawn was feeling a little insecure at this point, and maybe she felt that her friend Carl was getting along a little too well with Jonathan. It may sound silly to us right now, but if I try to put myself in Dawn's shoes... I can understand that her emotions may have gotten the better of her, and paired with being under the influence, 
that's erupted into something bigger than it was. When I spoke to Jonathan, I could hear the regret in his voice when he discussed how he reacted. If this had been any normal disagreement between the two, they'd likely just have made up the next morning. And there would be no reason for regret. Sadly, he would not get the chance to make up with his sister. Dawn stormed away from the group and headed to the cottage where Emma was sleeping. As you heard Jonathan say, everyone thought Dawn was going to sleep it off. Emma would later report, though, that she'd been briefly awakened from sleep by hearing someone rustling at the foot of her bed. We now know that this had to have been Dawn getting her cell phone and house keys out of Emma's bag. Sixteen years later, understandably the details are a little hazy, but Jonathan believes that this must have been around midnight. Uh, and we carried on fishing until the early hours in the morning. I mean, my brother already flaked out. Um, he, he was camping chair sort of thing. And, and he, he flaked out as well. You know, and, and me and Carl, we, we just carried on fishing. The rest of the group made their way to bed in the early hours of the morning, Jonathan says. The next morning, Jonathan was awoken by his fiancée, Emma, asking him where Dawn was. Hung over and tired, Jonathan says he figured she must have just gone to sleep it off elsewhere in the resort. Emma realised that Dawn's keys and cell phone were gone, and they found wet clothes on the floor of the cottage. Dawn had changed before leaving after getting wet in the rain the previous night. If anyone has ever been on a trip like this in their youth, where there's a fair amount of drinking going on, you'll agree that it's not strange for people to fall asleep in strange places. Most commonly, not their actual bed. So when Dawn wasn't there, panic didn't immediately set in for the group, as they'd expected her to come wandering back into camp at any moment. I initially thought, right, she was on site somewhere. I was adamant that she was, she was sort of like, because it was like people in sort of caravans and stuff. I do caravanning myself now, so reflecting back now, those people in those caravans looked like they were there for quite a while because they had the awnings out and they had like little fairy lights around them, and, you know, like home from home sort of set up, you know what I mean? And uh, I, I, I thought she was sort of in amongst them. So I wasn't panicked initially when they said, oh, where's Dawn sort of thing. And this, you know, when Emma came in, she, she woke us up, she says, you know, where, where's Dawn? I wasn't really probably somewhere, you know, is she in the car? Is she sleeping in the car? You know, is she, you know, and, and you, so is she maybe, you know, you start thinking around. And then when, when the dust settled later on that day, and you think, bloody hell, where is she? And we found Alicia and she's not, where, where is she then? And then panic sets in. But Dawn did not wander back into camp. And as the hours ticked by, they started to realise that something was not right. Jonathan called Dawn's friend, Alicia. Um, so my name is Alicia, and I was a very close friend of Dawn uh, before she went missing. We met while I was studying, and she was working. We were part of the same social circle, and we became really close. So uh, Dawn's brother, Jonathan, and his then fiance Emma, came to South Africa and they were staying with Dawn. They came on a holiday, kind of, um, and actually to get married. And they decided they were going on a, it was actually a midweek break, to Van Boer, which is a fishing resort kind of camping place in Lindeker's Drift, which is in the northwest province. And it, it's almost like a, a in-the-middle-of-nowhere kind of place. And um, they went with Dawn's younger brother, Alan, and a friend of ours, Carl, and a girlfriend of his. I didn't go with um, fishing and camping is not really my thing. And if I recall correctly, I wasn't well at the time. They left for the, the camping trip. And the next morning, I got a phone call quite early to ask me um, whether I knew where Dawn was, whether she was with me. And obviously, she wasn't. 
and that's when I was informed that something had kind of happened the night before and they'd landed up in an argument and she had stormed off from the campsite. And that was basically the last kind of confirmed sighting, if you will, of Dawn. After searching the campsite themselves and asking other holiday makers if they'd seen Dawn, Jonathan realised that it was time to get the police involved. The owner of the resort was notified and police arrived pretty quickly, but their reaction was not what her siblings or friends had expected. Initially, the police were semi-reluctant to open a case. They basically said that due to her age, um, she might have just wanted to disappear, which was totally against her character. And I think that's why everyone was adamant that this was something serious. So, yeah, from the beginning, the the police were sceptical. This was just someone who had just walked away and they didn't want to be found kind of thing. I, I must admit, when I was out there and the police were so chilled out, really, I couldn't believe how chilled out they were about all of this. Uh, but when, what, what got me a little bit was when uh, the police officer says to me, well, she, you know, we've got to give it a certain time because it obviously doesn't fall under the minor category. Uh, but she might not want to be found, which said to me at that time, ah, right, they found her, but she doesn't want to be found, if that makes sense, in inverted common, which kind of put us, like, well, yeah, no, and we had to respect that, you know. So essentially what police were saying is that because Dawn was an adult, she may have decided to walk away from her life, or she may just need more time to cool down from the argument. This would be fair enough if they had been having a bra in someone's garden in a house in Johannesburg, but they weren't. They were at least an hour's driving distance from anything Dawn knew, and she did not have access to a car. Dawn was on foot, had only her cell phone and house keys, and she'd reportedly been drinking. There was also a pretty large body of water nearby. My mind immediately goes to a drowning risk. By this time, many of Dawn's friends, including Alicia, had gone to Van Boer to try and help find Dawn. The uh, owner of Van Boer is actually the head of the local CPF, and he was instrumental in driving the police to actually spear a, a search, if you will. There were local and you know neighbouring farmers and landowners that helped. They brought in, um, we were told, helicopter helicopters. They searched the river. There were cadaver dogs brought in. They were diving a diving team brought in. We've tried to exhaust all possibilities. Despite all of these efforts, there was no sign of Dawn. Her cell phone records indicated that the last activity on her phone was at quarter to six in the morning on the 20th of November, 2004. At this time, a message, or please call me, had been sent to the son of Dawn's landlord. I asked Jonathan if this would be someone that Dawn would logically contact for help, as I couldn't help but wonder if it had simply been a misdial by someone who already had her phone. Jonathan says, though, that Dawn had become quite close with her landlord and his family, and it would make sense to him that she might contact him for help. The young man only discovered the message hours later, and by then... Dawn was no longer answering her phone. The fact that we don't know for sure what time Dawn left the campsite makes it difficult to make a determination. Jonathan thinks that she'd stormed off around midnight. It would make sense to me that she would wait until a decent hour in the morning to try and contact someone for a lift. So perhaps that is why there's an almost six-hour gap between the time she's believed to have left and the time of the last activity on her phone. The average person can walk about five kilometres in an hour. 
If Dawn had walked continuously for six hours before trying to contact her friend, she could have made it 30 kilometres away from the campsite by that time. I do think that's highly unlikely, though. She hadn't slept, and she had been drinking. I think there's a greater possibility that she wouldn't have made it that far if she did start walking. And there's also a possibility that she'd waited somewhere in the resort for a while, deciding what to do. Alicia does not think it is strange that Dawn would have left the camp on foot that night. Yes, I think she, you know, she was very, very, a very, very determined personality. So if she had decided that she didn't want to be at the camping trip anymore and she wanted to go home, then that's what she would have done. So I believe, yeah, something happened to her on that road and that's where our, the piece to the puzzle lies. The search for Dawn soon started to wind down, and Alicia says right in the beginning, they really had no idea what to do. And it's also, it's like at the time, there was so much going on, and it was, I mean, I don't think anyone knows what to do when someone goes missing. It's, it's such a, there's no formula to it. So I think everyone was running on a bit of automatic, and then you sit back and you think, okay, now hang on, how does this actually all fit together? And yeah, it's... It gets a little bit hazy. Jonathan and Emma travelled between Van Boer and Johannesburg, trying to figure out where Dawn had gone. And I asked him if he'd returned to Dawn's flat. Yeah, we did, because obviously we've had had some personal belongings in there, uh, all these different monsters in there, so we had to sort of then enter it somehow. It's a life we were bringing like that. He uh, he got us active into into the... like, uh, he kindly sort of let us stay there. Uh, we still con- continued paying him sort of the rent and stuff like that. Um, you know, he was, he was, he was, he was quite very supportive in, in the call. I also asked him if there was any sign that Dawn had been there. Not at all. There's no forced entry or anything like that. And they would have known if she'd been back. Because obviously, if you can imagine, it's like a little garage conversion. Uh, and they've got like guard dogs and stuff, and you know, they, they would have known she would have been back. Jonathan says that in the early days of Dawn going missing, he realizes that many people pointed fingers at him. Her friends seemed to feel that he'd appeared out of nowhere and fought with Dawn, and then suddenly she was missing. For his part, he says that the complete mystery behind her disappearance made him paranoid too. He even briefly wondered if her friends were hiding her. He and his brother had an argument about Dawn's disappearance as well. Emotions were running high. The days and then weeks and months ticked by, and there was simply no sign of Dawn. Eventually, Emma's visa was about to expire, and Jonathan had to get back to work in the UK. They had no choice but to leave South Africa and the mystery of their missing loved one behind. Alicia says that the police efforts to find Dawn was minimal, although there were certainly those members of law enforcement who had tried their best. There was also a strange coincidence about the location of the resort that she believes may have hampered the case. Well, that was the one thing about Dawn's disappearance, is where the, the resort is based, it's almost on the border of the northwest and Gauteng. You know, should something have, you know, been discovered on one side of, um, you know, the, the jurisdiction, would it have been passed? We don't know. So it, it's, been, it's been frustrating, yes. And she had this to say about the police's involvement in the case in the long term. Over the years, there hasn't really been much serious police involvement and um, there have been individuals who have been amazing like captain judith swanapool and they've gone out of their way i mean she she's based she was at the time based in frankfurt which is not even you know in her jurisdiction but she really went out of her way to try and help us other than that there hasn't really been much proactive police work it's been i think they've just filed her filed her away Over the years, Alicia says that several individuals have approached her to help find Dawn. 
So, well, we've been approached by several individuals in, over the years. People have helped uh, private investigators as well. They've come on board and not, not you know, not um, had any results. And I started liaising with Leon. So it's over 10 years ago, maybe about 12 years ago, 11, 12 years ago. And he has stuck by me and really like pushed every angle. He's phenomenal. He's really been like such a blessing. Um, so I'm so grateful for him. Just to know that someone else has got my back here. I'm not going crazy and imagining, you know, imagining this and doing this all alone. We were approached by a medium um, who connected to, um, through a friend of mine. And um, she basically told us, uh, you know, what, what she had visioned. And her and I went out to Funbur, to the to the resort. She explained in her, you know, in her perspective what she was seeing um, what had happened to Dawn. So, yeah, it's, it's been, there have been a couple of psychics, but that, that one was possibly the most profound in that she, it was almost eerie and chilling. She walked like Dawn when she was going through where she was, and it, it was bizarre, yeah. Her ex- explanation was that Dawn had started walking towards home, maybe to, I don't know, hitch a ride or I'm not sure, to, uh, back towards Johannesburg. And at the time, there was road construction. So, you know, she would have had to walk pretty much in the road because the, the sides of the road had been dug up. And um, Donna said that her vision showed her that Dawn had been knocked by a car. It was very you know, early morning, so it would have been semi-dark still. And she'd been hit by a car and the two young people that were driving panicked and um, they buried her. So let's unpack that because there's a lot of information in there. Firstly, Alicia mentions Leon Rousseau, who out of his own made contact with her and offered his services. Leon has made more headway in this case than anyone else ever has. We'll get into more about that in a minute. First, let's discuss the medium or psychic. Now, every missing person's family I've ever spoken to has been contacted by a psychic or 12. They seem to come out of the woodwork in cases like this. For the most part, nothing ever comes of their information. But the way that Alicia speaks about this one gave me pause for thought. Firstly, she didn't contact Alicia. The referral was made through a friend. Alicia's description of the woman taking on Dawn's mannerisms while at the site is also clearly pretty chilling. From my conversations with Alicia, I can tell you that she is a level-headed person. She's not one to suffer fools gladly. So the fact that she gave this woman the time of day makes me think that perhaps we should too. The scene that the medium paints is not entirely unlikely. If Dawn had made it to the road and was walking in an attempt to get back home, she may well have been on that road where construction was taking place. Someone may well have accidentally struck her and killed her. It's also possible that their car may have still been drivable after that. Had they put her into a hole, covered her up with sand and left her there? Maybe. The medium had more information for Alicia as well. I got a a GPS coordinates of where Dana identified, you know, according to her, where, where Dawn was buried. I did send the coordinates to the police, who assured me that they had done due diligence and um, checked it out. But yes, uh, Leon and I have said maybe we should go out with like a forensic team and, you know, have a deeper, a deeper look. So the medium, Dana, gave Alicia GPS coordinates of where she believes Dawn's remains are located. Would the police have actually followed this up? What is due diligence, in their opinion? 
And that leads us back to Leon Rousseau and what he's managed to figure out. Leon was able to determine that a week after Dawn's disappearance, her phone was switched back on and a new SIM card was inserted into it. Leon was able to track down the person who had the phone, but Alicia explains that he is not always able to share all of the information with her for her own protection. This is something that families and friends of missing and murdered people find very difficult to understand sometimes. A person investigating a case, whether it's a private investigator or a policeman, cannot always give you a running commentary of what they've discovered. Firstly, they have to confirm that the information is correct. And secondly, family and friends may well take that information into their own hands and disrupt the case. It's happened before, and perpetrators have walked free because of it. So we know that Leon has identified the person who had Dawn's phone, and that lead is still being chased down by him. It's important to remember, though, that just because someone had her phone, that doesn't mean they had anything to do with her disappearance. If Dawn had been knocked down by a car, Her phone may have been flung away from her and landed on the side of the road. Someone may have just picked it up. One would like to think that if you pick up a phone, charge it with the intention of using it, and suddenly it starts ringing with people wanting to know where a missing person is, you would hand that phone in at the nearest police station. But we all don't think the same way. The other thing that Leon discovered was that something had gone horribly wrong in the recording of Dawn's information on her missing persons file. He actually noticed that her ID number had been incorrectly logged on the police's central data system. So we've changed that. He's changed that now so that it's actually um, correct. So for years... Dawn's ID number had not even been flagged. This is what Jonathan feels could have been missed through this error. And also the other bit uh, is where have they got the, her ID wrong? Only up until now, I'm like, no wonder, no wonder no. We had to go to Edinburgh Police Station. I don't know, we had to do an affidavit or something like that. I, don't, I can't remember if they said that she was not on a missing list or anything like that. Well, that was a bit concerning because obviously we've reported all the missing. We thought that they do speak to one another. Uh, and that's our naivety. You know, you just think, uh, and then when they ask you to do stuff, you just do it or you take it for granted. If they tell you something, you take their word for it because that's their, that's their job. It makes sense. And now, only now to find out if they've got her ID wrong, I think is a vital flaw, a vital, vital flaw in the the early stages of trying to find Dawny. Because had they searched that and had that cropped up anywhere, but at some point they, she would have had to given up her birth date and stuff like that, and she can reapply for an ID. I had to do it when I went back to South Africa because I didn't have my ID. So I did exactly the same process. I queued for just about a day. Then I spoke to somebody, gave them my, uh, my birth details and stuff like that. And then they pulled my, my birth certificate up and I got a new ID. As easy as that. Right? As literally as easy as that. And you can do that because it happens. The fact that, that that facility is there, right, and the fact that she went on to start a new life, let her argue and say that's what she wanted to do. There is a vital flaw in the system that if they did not have the correct ID, it, nothing would have flagged up. And that is the only information that has been made public about this case. That's where the trail ends. One of the things that Leon suggested as well was that DNA needed to be procured that could be compared to any unidentified remains that had been found. Initially, they were going to use Jonathan's DNA. But then Alicia remembered something that she'd done when she was clearing up Dawn's flat all those years ago. So many years ago, I had to pack up Dawn's flat and her belongings and whatnot. And... It was this very strange feeling um, telling me to save hair that I found on her clothing. And I did. And I've now handed that over to Leon 
So we are going to be doing and um, trying to get a DNA strain from from that, and potentially run it through the system and see if it links up to any Jane Doe's or, or anything like that. It's just it's weird because I mean we sat uh, a friend of mine and I we sat together and you know had a, a good old cry while we went through her clothes and you know saved hair. I mean it's 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 uh, it's very bizarre and but um. Yeah, it was just that trying to preserve any link or, you know. My brother still said to me, no, it's, it's not strange that you've got an envelope of your friend's hair in your, in your wardrobe, is it? I said, no, not strange at all. <laughs> Alicia had picked hair off Dawn's clothing and collected it in an envelope. That envelope had been sealed and packed away. And now, 16 years later, it might just be the key to finding out what happened to her friend. Throughout the years, Alicia has done everything she can to raise awareness to Dawn's case. She's written articles, she's had others write articles, and most recently appeared in the TV series For Miss to try and get her friend's face back in the public eye. Alicia also started a Facebook page for Dawn's case, called Help Us Find Dawn Byrne. The posts on the page speak to how loved Dawn was. I commended Alicia when I spoke to her for her amazing efforts in trying to find her friend. You know, my motivation is, you know, I always try and think of how I would feel if I was in that position. And Dawn or didn't have parents. You know, there wasn't really anyone else to look for her. So... And I just believe that, you know, everyone deserves justice. Everyone deserves dignity. And if it means that I have to kind of, like you say, carry that torch, then, you know, so be it. Jonathan has since had two daughters with Emma, and he lives in the UK. I've left out quite a bit of my conversation with Jonathan, simply out of respect for him. He strikes me as an intensely private person. But I will say that our conversation revealed a man who is deeply wracked with guilt about the last interaction with his sister. He expressed to me that he's tried to deal with all the grief that the many losses the siblings experienced caused for years. And this is where I must share the most recent tragedy in the Byrne family. In 2017, Dawn and Jonathan's younger brother, Alan, who was also there the night that Dawn went missing, took his own life. Jonathan feels sure that Dawn's disappearance played a major role in his brother's downward spiral. They'd been one another's rock, and Alan's death is yet another thing that Jonathan feels regretful. While I understand why he feels this way, Depression is an ugly and often inexplicable thing. And I don't think that many people could come out of what the Byrne children experienced unscathed. Alan simply could not see the light at the end of the tunnel. What happened to Dawn Byrne in the early hours of the 20th of November 2004? We know she left the campsite and there was no sign of foul play at that site. I had considered that someone may have taken her before she even left the campsite, maybe someone living there, but her activity on her phone six hours after she left seems to discount that theory. That resort was also searched with a fine tooth comb, and no sign was found of Dawn, dead or alive. So if we agree that she made it to the road, where did she go from there? Was she hit, either accidentally or intentionally, by a vehicle and killed? Is she buried where the medium says she is? There's something that Jonathan told me about Dawn that I found interesting. She was very confident around all types of people. He said that she'd even regularly use taxis as transport. 
He also describes her as extremely street smart, though. So that's paired with the attempt to get hold of her landlord's son. Made me wonder if Dawn may have hitched a lift. Would she have gotten into a car with someone she didn't know? I tend to doubt that, if she was as street smart as Jonathan says she was. But she may well have flagged down a passing taxi. And from there, who knows? The final theory, of course, is that Dawn, on that dark morning, decided to walk away from everything she had built for herself and start a new life. Is that possible? Yes. In my opinion, though, it's highly unlikely. And Alicia agrees. And, the, I mean, she had just, she had literally, she had started building a really good life for herself and she had good prospects and, you know, she, she had she had a good life. So to just walk away from all of that based on a, a silly argument, it, it just doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. And I agree. Would Dawn really have left her brothers and friends behind and just started again somewhere else? Jonathan holds out hope that his sister is still alive, but he also has his own theory. Along the lines of what I mentioned with her getting into a taxi or a car, he had this to say about what could have happened. They put her in the car, but, you know, they lulled her into, and then asked her where she wanted to be. She wanted to be in Johannesburg, going back to the fact. And they wanted payment. They gave her, she probably gave her the phone, and then these people did what they needed to do. Now, how, or she got run over. Now, I don't, Dawn doesn't come across as a person that, that will get run over. I don't know. Uh, you would have had to be very unlucky, or they would have had to deliberately veer off the road. So many theories, and so little proof of anything. So where to from here? Searching the area around the GPS coordinates identified by the medium would certainly be a good start. Getting Dawn's DNA into the national database is also imperative. This is what Jonathan feels needs to happen. I reckon what needs to happen now is key is get forensics involved. I generally do. I mean, it just goes to show, I work with a lot of analytics as well, and uh, facts and figures and stuff. Uh, what Leon has done is just slightly scratched the surface and he's seen an anomaly. And that, to me, proves that, just by a little bit of, uh, excuse the pun, digging. I, I feel, in my heart, this is just from a brother, I feel that Dawn is still alive. I, I genuinely do. I think she's alive and she's happy. I think she may actually be living in a pseudonym somewhere, uh, probably quite close to sort of fitting in a thing, probably. Uh, and that's in my head. That's a little fairy tale I've got in my head. Reality speaking and facing all the facts and stuff, I think she's been taken. I, th- I think she's been taken from us. Taken. Taken from here or taken from us permanently? That's the question. I think it's only natural for her brother to cling to the hope that Dawn might still be alive out there somewhere. That would be the best case scenario, of course. The facts, though, seem to lead us in a different direction. Leon Rousseau says that in order for this case to be solved... Anyone with information about Dawn's whereabouts or fate needs to come forward. You may have been driving down that dark road that morning. Maybe you accidentally hit her and panicked. Maybe you'd been drinking and were worried that you'd get in trouble. Maybe you intentionally took Dawn Burns' life in a moment of madness that's haunted you ever since. Either way, all that those who love Dawn want to know is where she is. That's it. Surely you can give them that. 
Alicia just wants the truth to come out, and she misses her beautiful, strong friend. I just believe she she deserves dignity. She deserves to have her story or whatever whatever that is. She deserves to have, you know, to have that known. And people don't just disappear. People don't just drop off the, the side of the earth. And we're all connected in some way or another. And someone out there knows something. And yeah, you can only just hope that it you appeal to their their better conscience. But yeah, someone out there knows something and that, that'll that answer, you know, so many questions. <laughs> she had such a strong character, you know, and for, for someone that's been through so much to not be a victim of their past or not use their past as like an excuse for not actually bettering themselves. She was the total opposite of that. She was such a go-getter and worked like incredibly hard. She, she, yeah, she was just like a very, a very special and driven young, young woman. Jonathan still feels the sting of the accusations that were made against him, but he understands that he wasn't the only one that loved Dawn. There's a lot of friends hanging on this, and I feel for them because, you know, she's been in, she's been in this orphanage, Arbor and Peel Generation. She became their sister as well. You know, so as much as she's my biological sister, they saw Dorney grow up. Uh, it's, it's as much as my sister, their sister, it's definitely uh, her friends and all that. So I feel some. And that is very true. Although Dawn's biological family may have shrunk in size, she lived from the age of 12 in a home with other children who would also live difficult lives. These kids would have lived all of their teenage years together, so they would have felt the pain of her loss just as much as anyone else. I asked Jonathan what his ideal outcome would be for this case. For closure, that's all. You know, I've got two little girls as well. I see them. I see Dawny and her. Obviously, I, I do hope she's okay if she's alive. I hope. You know, I just, I just want to know if, if that is the case, if she's fine. You know, if, that, if she doesn't want anything to do with us, it's fine. It's actually fine. I can live my life. And I know it's a selfish thing to say, but it's eating your life. It really is. And, I'm, and, and I don't want to bring my girls up um, with a dad that's miserable all the time. And this is the generational impact of what happens when someone goes missing and is not found. The frustration, the misery, and the grief get passed down through the generations. And I think that's something we need to think about when we look at a missing persons poster. The human being behind the picture. Often you see a a missing poster and you think, okay, it's, it's, it's sad, you know, that person's, you know, missing. But you don't actually realize that, you know, That person, well, with Dawn's case, she was a sister. She was someone's daughter. She was loved. She was someone's friend. She wasn't just a random person who existed in in the void. Um, She was very connected with her 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 people, her her circle, and the the ripple effects of that have been quite quite far reaching. You know, you you realize how many how many people's lives she actually did touch, and I think finding some kind of closure will be, it's beneficial for everyone. Dawn Byrne was just starting out in life after a really rough beginning. She was fun, confident and well-loved. She didn't just evaporate into thin air. Alicia deserves to have some finality to this after all these years. Jonathan deserves to be able to raise his family and feel like he's completely present with them. Every single person who knew and loved Dawn deserves to know what happened to her, no matter what that may be. Dawn deserves to have her truth told. If you have any information about the disappearance of Dawn Byrne, please contact Leon Rousseau 
on 063 682 5758. That's 063 682 5758. If you want to remain anonymous and you just want to provide details of Dawn's location or the location of her remains, you can do that too. It's time for her to come home, one way or another. Thank you for listening to episode 40, The Disappearance of Dawn Byrne. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the platform you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. I'll be back next Friday with a Spotlight Minisode. Until then, as always, thank you for your support and I'll chat to you soon. <laughs>